essentially three different classes. I'll focus on the first two. One that you can see I'm just creating some property values and putting them on the council window. Same thing with the new ones. They're related from this perspective, it doesn't look like there's much different between these two. Okay. Let's take a look at how they're implemented. So if I go to this class, you'll notice that I have two properties, one's a good, one with a get setter, so that's uh, read and write, and the other one is just read only, um, because the setter is private. So if somebody that wants to use an instance of this, of this class, they won't be able to change read only data from the outside. Okay? That, that won't be available to users. But this isn't what, this gets you as close as you can to do read only properties. And more than one mutable property, because once it's set, it can't be changed. But I could change this internally in the class. So if I you know, added another method here, and I said green only data equal to quit, that's perfectly acceptable. So even though my intention when I designed this class was I wanted that property to be immutable, it really isn't. Somebody could come back later and change it at some future point. And then that semantic isn't enforced. Okay, I'd actually have more code to do that. So how can I do this differently? Let's see, sharp six. There's a couple different things. First thing is, if you look at this code, I can now do what's called a proper initializer. So you'll notice that this is the read-write one, but I can say when this object is created, set it to that value. So I don't necessarily have to create a new structure to do that. I can just set that right in the property. I can also do it in this case, but notice that all I have here is just get. Okay. So what happens underneath the scenes with this property is what I have down in this comment. So what the compiler is going to generate is whenever you do a property like that, when you say get and set, and you don't actually specify how those properties should work or how they're implemented, the compiler is going to create two fields for, or a field for you that's essentially called the backend field. You can even see it in its name. By the way, this is a legitimate name for a property. Okay. Um, they do it in this way because they don't necessarily want people to do really nasty, awful things with reflection and go, oh, that's it. The, the name of it is going to be the name of the uh, property with a K and two underscores and then a backend field. Uh, I think that's actually changed in some versions of C Sharp because they don't want people to rely upon that naming convention. And you shouldn't. You should just ignore that that's even there. But there has to be a field there that the compiler can talk to when it implements the properties for you to say store the field, store that value in this field, or retrieve it from the field. Now, with the one that's read and write, you notice that the backend field is just defined this way. In the case of the property that's read-only, the field is called read-only. This is important because if I came back up to my class and somebody in a future version decided to do what I talked about, which is to add some code to say this is more data, this is what I do with, I should get a squiggle on here. So the compiler is smart enough to understand that you can only assign this on construction, okay? So that's why I can do this, because a new wood value is going to be assigned in the property, but ha that happens when an instance of this class is made. After that, I can't change it, okay? So again, a small thing, but it's getting closer to supporting immutable semantics in C Sharp with your objects. And that's a good thing, because if you're doing anything with Programming. If you know your object state is not going to change, you can share it across different tasks and threads and not worry about running into any um, uh, concurrent, any issues with concurrency in the sense of what is the state of this object that doesn't change from one version to another. You can't. So you don't need to worry about you know, having shared access across different tasks. Okay, so that's properties. Again, that was a very small one, but um, small but nice feature. Now methods. All right. So this code, I have this class old methods, 
And what I use that object is to print out some stuff using a text frame. I then figure out the minimum value of this object. You can see how this is all in a moment. I then change the state of the object. So this isn't an immutable object. I'll actually want to change the state in this case to two different values. I'll print something again, and I'll calculate the minimum value. Same thing happens with the new way of being able to do things in C sharp. I run this. There should be no difference in the output. Again, it looks very simple. If I go look at old methods, what I have here is to calculate the minimum is I use this method here. And this method get minimum is a static method. Yeah. And it uses in turn map.min. So a lot of indirection that there's a point to why I'm doing all this just here. The, the print method here, which gets a text writer, uses this method produce, and that's an extension method. Okay, so if I go look at that method, you see that this keyword in front of the first argument, so that means it's an extension method, and it just calls the right line on the text. Now, some people, especially when you, when you look at static methods, like this one, map.man, what has been argued for is the ability to say, you know, instead of typing map dot all the time, if I know I'm going to be targeting the math class, I want to just be able to type return min. Now this is actually something that I don't do as a coding convention. If I ever call method, I'll usually put the name of the class in static, or the, the instance, like this, or the, vari the variable name or whatever, to make it very clear as to which method I'm calling. Okay? That's just my convention. Some people don't do that, they'll just, in this case, back here, um, and instead of saying like this dot x when I'm talking that property, they just want to say x. It's six says one half dozen of the other, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just more for code purposes. But because you can do this with instance members and fields and methods, and not have to specify this, well why can't I do that with static methods? So there's a new feature that's available that I don't necessarily like for static methods, but I think it actually works well for extension methods. And this is what it is. So if we go to new methods here, the first thing I'll notice that is if I can implement a method with one statement, okay, like calculate minimum is essentially just going get minimum. If you can do this where it's just one statement, you can actually use the, the lambda syntax, the fat arrow syntax. Um, this compiles exactly to what you saw before with the two, you know, the curly braces on each side. So there's no difference in implementation. It is not a lambda, it's not a func, it's not an action. That's just the way the method is implemented. Okay. So is this really saving you a lot of, you know, typing? You'd have to type two characters anyway, so is it you know, that big of a deal? Um, it's, it's kind of a nice thing to do, especially if you have a really short implementation. Maybe it's arguably easier to read. Okay. So you can do that now if your method basically takes one statement. But you'll also notice that get, get minimum here, I'm not specifying which class it came from. The reason why is because if I come up to the using statements here, and now I added using static. So what using static does, and I don't mean to bring in Java as a language, as we were talking before I started, that C sharp was essentially written as a response to the Java language way back in the late 90s. Um, the best way to describe using static is it's importing. So there's this, this import keyword in, in Java code. You're importing all the members from that class there, the new method elements. So in this case, I don't have to specify the name of the class here. If I go back to my code in C sharp 5, but if the, so that this is being done in C sharp 5, and I took this off, I should, yeah, I should get an error because I can't resolve where that method calls from. But now I can't, so I can get away with not putting that class in. Um, if I put this here and say, I also have a get minimum method here, this will resolve, even with that using static, it will resolve to the private static method in the 
this class. So there is an order of precedence. If there is a, a method that it can call within the class, we'll do that one first. Otherwise, we'll start looking for using statics and seeing if we can find a method that matches that there. Okay. Now again, I, as a naming convention or as a coding convention, I, don't, I personally don't like this. I don't think it reads very well. But what I do like about using static is with, um, with extension methods. Okay. So this writer.write, which I showed before, which was an extension method, I can now say using static here, and it can be a little bit more specific as to where that extension method is coming from. Typically, what you did before is I would just say using, let's do in C sharp 6, features, methods, helpers. But I couldn't be more specific as to where that extension method was defined. Okay, so if there were two extension methods that I could resolve with that write call from that namespace, I would get an error because we wouldn't know which one to call. So this makes it very specific to say just look at that class for this extension method here. Okay. Now, one thing that's nice in Visual Studio 2015 is they're adding more and more refactoring tools all the time. And I should, there you go, right, so I can zoom in. Um, because I took away that using statement, I couldn't figure out what the right was. And so if I did the control period, which essentially brings up the light bulb and brings up the factory and stuff like that, I get this as a code fix, which is just to say put that using statement up top. Okay. Well, that's nice, but what I'd like them to be able to do is add a second option here, which is say using static, that whole thing at the top, and just add that for me as well. So I want to be specific as to where, you know, which class I'm using to bring in that static method. It would, it would provide that as a code fix option. Fix option. Yeah. All right. So, so that's that's my. Let's move on to null conditional and string interpolation. All right. So in this case, I have a parent and a child, and this is a very typical scenario where people. When you're creating code in C sharp, you have objects that are related to other objects that are using other objects. There's a parent child relationship between the two. Extremely common, happens all the time. Yeah. So, in this code, I have reference to a child, and that child is an old child that acts in a certain way. I do the same thing with a new child. Yeah. Now, if I, I can also do this, because in this case, I don't have an argument null check on that parameter that's being passed, or that argument that's being passed into the constructor. Okay. So if I try to print out the value of the child object here, this won't actually fail. Okay. What will happen is that it will just say parent version, and then nothing gets printed at the end. But if I try to print out the contents of two string from the child, I'll get a null reference exception because child is null, and I can't just call any number on it. One way to get around this in C sharp 6 is to use what's called a null conditional operator. Okay. So I'm just zooming in on that so you can see it's a question mark here. Yeah. For some reason, people at Microsoft has called that the Elvis operator. I guess if you look at it, it's the question mark it looks like the curly thing, the hair in his hand that was wise. I, I hate that. I think that's a Dallas thing they ever said. Well, maybe not the Dallas thing they ever said, but. I, I never got where that looks like Elvis, but you'll hear that sometimes. Um, we'll, we'll call it that. What this is essentially saying is, if the thing on the left is not null, then do the thing on the right. If it is null, don't do anything. Okay. So it's it's essentially a nice thing where if it's let me remark that if the thing on the left is null, return it. Set, but don't make that call. Don't call right now. Okay. So in this case, I will be not null, so I'll print right line. But in this case, with the safe parent, child will be null, so I won't get this. And now this operator, which basically says, 
if the thing on the left is null, then do the thing on the right. So, because child is null, this is going to return null. So then this operator will see that that's null and print that out. And if I run this code, that's what I should see. Alright, so that's a null condition operator, and I'll show another example later with the event handlers that makes that where this comes really uh, handy. By the way, if you ever make something like var x equals 4, so I have a value type, uh, I have an integer or a weight or something like that, and then I do x question mark to string, I should get an error. So if you have a value type, a value type is always not null. You can't make a value type null. So there's no reason to, to do a question you know, do the null conditional operator on value types. And the compiler actually bark you and say, you can't do that. Now, this can also get very tempting to just do question mark period everywhere in your code. Uh, quite frankly, I would get away from trying to handle nulls in the first place. Nulls are bad, awful, evil. You should try to have not nullable code as much as you can. So use these sparingly, but if you run into situations where you're not confident where that thing on the left may or may not be null, then this can be this can come in handy. And again, I'll show an example later on with my handlers where this actually does come in very, very handy. So that's the null conditional operator. Now if I run this code again, you notice that. When I print out the contents of some of these objects, I'm getting a nice formatted screen. So let's take a look at what those look like. So if I go to my old child, you'll notice that the two string here is done in kind of a typical fashion, I'm formatting it in a way where I can print out the first name, the last name, and then also the birth date. I can also do it this way. This sometimes has led to some very interesting conversations of should you do string concatenation or string format because from a performance standpoint, which one is better? Typically, string concatenation is considered okay if you're around three or four concatenations. You get beyond that, and you can start running into some performance issues based on the code that's generated when you do string concatenation. String format is arguably safer, and in the long haul, will be arguably performant. I keep throwing all these you know, wishy-washy terms around because ultimately performance is based on running performance tests and making sure that your code is running the way you expect it to and also runs fast. You know, if somebody says, which, you know, which code is faster, I would say you're running performance tests compared to two. That's really the only way you're ever going to truly know that, that your code, one way of your code is better than the other. Okay. Now, this also is not potentially full. For example, if I inadvertently typed a one here, the code will still compile, it will still all work, but what's going to happen is last thing is going to be put in twice in a two string. And that's not what I intend. If I'm a VB developer, uh, where everything is typically one based, and so I did that, what's actually going to happen is I'm going to get an exception because the number of values I'm passing in to do in the format string is off. So there is no third or what's really a fourth value. And so that's why you're seeing this exception pop up here. Okay. Actually, in it does start at zero, at zero for string format. That, okay, so that doesn't surprise me uh, for the string format specifically. But I'm just saying, if you need array, there took be one base. So if you had that mindset where everything starts with one, you may do this and then realize, oh crap. Okay. Even if, you know, I'm kind of joking if you did that, but even if you just flat out just fat finger and said three here, and you meant two, you get the exception. So, it would be nice if we had something to be clear, and that's what string interpolation is. So, if I move down here, notice how you can do it now. Okay. So, you can stick a dollar sign in front of the string, and that tells the compiler that what you need to do is where I've put these holes, if you think of these as holes in the string to fill them in with whatever I'm putting in here. So it's very explicit as to what the string should look like. I'll have a first name, a space, last name, space, dash, space, birth date, 
formatted that way, so I can put the, the format of that string right here. Okay? Now, when I, when I did this talk one time, I gave some bad advice, which was if I comment this. I did that, where I want to do like a ternary operator. That's the age greater than 44, old or young. And you know, I'm getting a bunch of errors there. Well, because I am old, um, I remember way back in my C days in college, um, one of the tricks is, why isn't it my age? Oh, yes, yeah, because I have those variables there. Um, now I should work on different numbers. I wrote the questions. All right. That other line of code is still a fail, even when those variables in there. The trick is just put parentheses at the end. The code never compiles, just keep adding parentheses, especially over time. Yeah. So you can't put this kind of, that kind of code within um, interpolated strings. If I want to format an interpolated string, so let me comment these. I can do it this way. Okay. Now, I go to the using student. The name of the class is an extension. This really is an isn't an extension. You can't make an extension method with an interpolated string. What does that kind of sense? But what you can do is use a method like this, pass in what is essentially called a formatable string. That's what an interpolated string is in C sharp. And then also pass in the function. And then I can just do this dot two string the culture. In this line of code, you'll notice I'm going to pass in, uh, I think that's for Mexico. So if I run it now, what it should get for formatted value is, yeah, bars over. So these interpolated strings, I find them extremely useful. The only thing that's a little problematic with them is I can't do something like this. You know, um, you know so things are getting out of whack. I have to basically have it on the same line. I can do this, which is I can basically put the at sign in front of it. And that will work. But notice what's going to happen now, because if I put the at sign in front of the string, it's basically saying, literally print it out the way you see it, so now that you see a space or a line feed character turn after Jane. It's because I you know, literally put a line feed character turn in there. So that's how it's going to print it out. So these interpolate strings will essentially always be on one line. So it's certainly you know, a long, format of a string, it can start going off the right and there's not a really great way to handle that. But for smaller strings that you're doing string dot format, this actually I think this reads much reads much better in terms of what your intention is and what that string should look like. Alright. Back to our program here. 15 minutes left. So Careful in certain scenarios that can lead to memory leaks. You always want to make sure that you do a minus equals when you're done handling the event. Now, one way to get around it is to use something called weak references. There's a class called weak event manager that you can use to say, on this object, look for an event called two string call, and when that's called, then call this method. Okay. But since you're using weak references, won't run into any memory leaks or, or class or objects holding on to objects because event handler is essentially the source and the listener. Are, they, essentially, they essentially know about each other, which is not what you think it is, but that's the way it actually works. If you use weak references, only the listener knows about the source, the source doesn't know about the listener. So you get um, a lot less memory pressure on all of these. So this is one way to get around it. But notice that I have to be, I have to say that is the name of the method. And if I go to my child class here, you can see that's why. Okay. 
because that's the name of my mouth. In fact, I'm just showing you why this sucks. Because that's the name of the method I think it should be, but that's really not the name of the method, but the name of the event. It's two string invoke, but I have the string called two string call. So it's not going to be able to find it. So let's actually call it two string invoke to get it right. And run this code. So everything should work. It should get in there. And that's correct. Okay. And we can all this up. Come back to this, you'll notice uh, you're going to get like a, uh, a series of characters, and you don't know what you just did, and all of a sudden something just happens, and you're like, no, that. Um, the way I'm coding it here is you notice I'm using this thing called name of. And what name of does is it says whatever is within name of essentially bring back a string version of that member. Okay. So name of here is, is going to return to string invoke. But the nice thing about name of is that it survives refactorings. So if I come back to child here and I change the name of to string invoke, by the way, before I do that, notice down below here that in to string I raise that event. But this is where the null conditional operator comes in handy. Because if you want to do this correctly, you typically have to do var x equals this dot two string vote if x is not equal to no, then do x raising it with this event args. The point of what I just did here is that you can run into race conditions between that line of code or when you you know, basically that line code in this line. You think you're going to call the event, but in the time that you're going to set up the call, somebody may not be listening anymore, the event becomes null, and you can't just call it directly. Okay? So this is a common pattern that when you're doing events, you become really familiar with if you want to raise them. But the null conditional operator gets rid of that and doesn't call that. Because if that's null on the left, won't call it on the right. If it's not null, it will call the invoke on it. But it will do it basically as you saw with the code I had to generate by hand. So it's exactly what I just did, except I can do it more by the code. Okay. Alright, if I come back up to this met this event and I rename it and do call, and I run my code, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get an error. Because that other way of doing it where it had the hard-coded event name in the event uh, the weak event handle here, it's, it hasn't changed. But notice that here it did. Okay, so that's what's really nice about name. If you ever had to do any identify property changes, which is saying which property changed, you eventually have to produce a string for that property name. You can now just use name up and put that in there. This directly Get puts that string in your code. This isn't reflection at runtime or anything. If you actually looked at the assembly and disassembled it, you'll see two string call right in there. Okay. So, but but you don't have to worry about any reflection happening at runtime. And it's a much safer way to write code that has to rely upon a specific name of a member. Okay. All right. So a couple more. I'll do this one and then we'll go on to some things that maybe in C sharp seven. So exception law, exceptions in C sharp six, there's a couple things that have changed. One of them is if you're in an asynchronous method like I am here, and I do a try and then a catch, notice so in the catch block I can do an await. You couldn't do this in C sharp five when async and await was added. You couldn't await in a catch or a final block. Now you can. Okay, so everything will work just fine. So that's kind of because if you couldn't do this, and I wanted to call an asynchronous method, I'd have to do something like right line async, uh, wait, or whatever here. I couldn't actually call it in an asynchronous fashion. Now I can. So it's a much more natural uh, way of coding because you want, if you're using async and wait already in the method, you want to make everything async and wait. So that's one of them. 
Another one is this horrible class. We're using a logger. And I'm trying to do the remainder of two values. Okay? So the remainder is basically 10 divided by 6. That should be 4 as a result. But notice here, if I do 10 divided by 0, the world is supposed to blow up. Because anything divided by 0 shouldn't work. But I don't have a try catch block around this code. In fact, if I run this, nothing fails. Everything works as expected. The reason why is if I go into how this method is implemented, is there's now filtered exceptions in C sharp. So you notice that when after the catch. This is something that ironically VB had um, in its one version for .NET. It, it had filtered exceptions and C sharp never had them. I don't know why, but that was just the, that, that's just the way it was. So finally, C sharp now has filtered exceptions. So you can basically say, catch this exception. When that's true, if it's false, then it won't go into the catch block. Okay. So that's why when I did true here, I didn't get an exception. If I said false, what I should get is a divided by zero exception. All right. So does it just keep the exception otherwise? So if I true or what? So if this is true, it goes into whatever the catch block is supposed to do. If it's false, the catch block doesn't handle it, and it'll either go on to another catch block, or just it just keeps throwing the exception up to the callers. Right. Um, I really can't think of a great place where you want to use this, other than with some exceptions. I know, like if you're doing um, any HTTP calls. Sometimes you'll want to look at the exception and say when like the status code is, is a specific HTTP status code on the exception, then you'll want to go into a specific catch block to do you know to do some specific error handling. Um, that's like one of the few cases I can think of. Um, you may want to have a, a global way to turn catch blocks on or off, so that flag would be something that's set in the configuration, and either you catch them or you would, you know, but. I am not planning on using this filter exception thing a lot, but I can see where in some specific cases it could be useful. Yeah. All right, so our five minutes left. Uh, that's not all of them, but that's pretty much most of what you can do. I do want to spend some time because C Sharp 6 has been out now for about a year, year and a half, so it's not something new. Um, and we're already moving into well, what's going to be coming in C Sharp 7. The, the, the pace and the cadence of how things are being done with anything in the Microsoft world is changing rapidly. It's not where we're going to have, you know, between 2005 and 2008, we have this three-year gap. It's going to go down to a year or nine months or whatever. In fact, a lot of the features that I'm going to talk about, if you really are adventurous, you can fork the latest compiler um, repo and, you know, Compile the bits locally and, and go against some of these new features if you want. The preview edition of Visual Studio 15, which is not Visual Studio 2015, that's their version internally, and it sucks because the years are matching with the actual 2015, so people get confused. So Visual Studio 15, which will be the next version after Visual Studio 2015, already has some of these features that you can preview. So you can take a look at either one, you know, go either route if you want to see what's coming. Uh, a couple of them, one of them is called local functions. So you can now create a function within a function in C Sharp. Um, so in this code I just copied from their site. Um, all these examples I just copied what they're doing. But you can see that I actually define this iterator function within filter, and then I just call it from within this function. Okay. So if you ever have a case where, for whatever reason, I want to put this piece of code in, but I, I don't want to even have it as a private method my class because I don't want anybody else to have to know about it or see it. I can just put that code within that function but then call it as a function. Okay. So local functions will be available in C Sharp 7. Probably I have to keep caveat I guess because maybe it won't be there. But a lot of these seem like they're gonna be um, fairly certain that they'll be there. Tuples, we do have tuples already um, with the tuple type. But what I'm getting at here is you can notice that the return is not just one value, it's multiple values. Yeah, so languages like Python have had this for a while. 
but C sharp is going to get this now, so I can say I'm going to return a sum and a count. I can return a new, you notice I don't, I really kind of have an anonymous type here, where I'm saying sum and count is that. I can call the method and then print them out based on their values, and there's other syntax things that are in the works where I can say, even though those are the names of the variables coming out, I can use my own names or things like that. Um, but the point is, is to have a way to do tuples in the language that's very natural, has a nice name rather than the names you can get from tuple classes. They're all like item one, item two, and that stuff. So it's tuples pattern matching. Um, very small example here. But the point of this is that you're going to have a much more flexible switch statement. So I can do case statements that are based on patterns. So you know, so here I say case anything else, that wasn't what I expected, so for this exception. But I can say if the case uh, is a line or a rectangle or a circle, do these things. And this is this is actually a very simple example I can do on one slide. You can actually do a lot more in these case statements um, where you can basically say if it matches this pattern and do this. This is something that F sharp and other languages have had for a while, and now C sharp is going to essentially get this. Ref returns and locals, um, or ref locals and returns, is that now you can have a return value that's a ref. So in this case, notice that what I'm returning is actually a reference to whatever's coming out of that method. So this has some really nice performance uh, considerations, especially if I do things like with matrices and those only get really big. If I change that property on the matrix, it's literally the same reference, even if it's a value type from what came out here. If I don't have this, then it's always going like, to make a copy of that reference or copy of that value if it's a value type. This will actually refer to that value type. So you don't, in some cases, essentially do a double, you know, double your memory for a, a, a little bit. This will bring a direct reference back. So this has some nice um, memory consideration with this feature. And then the last one is the thing I'm extremely excited about is doing something like this. Um, the intent of what this goes on to show you is, if you've ever had to do I notify property change, you have to implement that interface, you have to have that event, you have to say every time a property changes, did it really change, and if the value changed, then raise that event. It's a simple thing to do, but it's monotonous. It's, you know, you have to keep repeating it all the time, and it sucks from that perspective. So what they're looking at is adding these things called source generators. So I can put this attribute up here, but this attribute is a compile time attribute. So this isn't going to be just at rest. This is going to be something that will actively change your code as soon as the compiler sees it. So what this can do is essentially add an interface, add the event, and then for every property, put that property change notification stuff in there. But this isn't limited to just property change. This can be for any piece of code, if you think of like aspect oriented programming or something like that, you can take any piece of code that you could essentially want to repeat in your application that isn't tied to a specific class or method, and just reuse that all over the place in your code. Okay. So like in this example, anytime I've had to do I notify property change, I could just put that compile time attribute there, and it would just generate it all. It would be debuggable. You could actually debug into that stuff, and you'd be good. Okay, so this is this was far beyond just this one specific case, even though this is the one that people always complain about a lot. Why don't you just generate this thing? It's going to let you generate code anywhere you want in C sharp. That has the potential of making your code substantially smaller, even though what may be implemented is what you have to write by hand. You don't have to write that by hand. It would just automatically have that in. This would be somewhat of an advanced feature, but I think the benefits are tremendous. It gives a lot of uh, potential for really making code much more succinct than this issue. You still have to still have your net handler, right? No. So look, in fact, there is a, um, a demo that Dustin Cam Campbell was on the .NET team at Microsoft he showed this at build um, right at the end of his of his demo, and basically what property change does is you notice I have partial here. It creates another partial class, and that's the one that has the event definition there. And then there's these other keywords called um, replace and original, 
because you have to look at this property and say what's the original value and then replace it with this. You know, like it, it gets complicated. But literally when the code gets compiled, it will have this class integer data implement that interface, it will have the event on it, and will have all the property change stuff for all these properties. But again, it's not just for property changes, it's for anything that you do in your code, like I want to make my class disposable. Instead of having to implement I disposable and handle all the rules around I disposable, because there's a lot. There's more than people think of it's just disposed. There's a lot more than that. Um, I could mark my class as being disposable. Generates everything for me, and I don't have to do any of that work myself. And that's the power of this, is that it makes the code that you write much smaller, and you can reuse these aspects and concerns across all of your code where you need it. Will, will it just be predefined properties that they implement that for? Or? They may provide some like property change, but it's open to anybody. This isn't going to be limited to just Microsoft. That, that, that world is gone. You know, the, the, this is this feature will be open so you can write your own source generators for anything in your code. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's that's what I like about this. Yeah. It's this feature I've been begging for for years, and to see that this is finally going to start to come to light. It's like the gears are sort of turning in my head all the time. Like, oh, I'd love to be able to just take this code and shrink it to this. Even though it's generated, you know, when it finally compiles, it's all going to have that code in there. But what I see and what I have to do is substantially small. So there are a couple other things. I mentioned binary literals. Um, that's going to be coming in C Sharp 7 potentially. All this is potentially. There's, there's no yes for getting this. This is still all in the works. Digit separators, out bars, and async main. So, um, what will be in the final version of C Sharp 7 is still to be determined, but it seems like they're kind of on their way in some of the things I showed in detail. Um, I'm pretty much, I'm, it, it's good to see where they're going with this stuff because, as I just said, it, it's, it's not Microsoft controlling everything. They, they technically will keep the path, they'll be the champions, they, they call them the benevolent dictators. Which, honestly, you need for any really good open source project to go. You need people that will give it a direction to move it. And they'll still do that, but they're, they've already accepted tons of pull requests from people fixing bugs, adding features, um, things in that net. C Sharp is, a, is the same way. C Sharp 7 is really the first version of the language that has been completely designed and implemented in the open. Because C Sharp 6 happened kind of in between. So it, it's it's a much better community than I think it ever has been before. There's, there's a lot more ability for people to get involved and say, I can, I can do what I've been able to do in other languages for years, which is directly affect how it works, and even in a small way. Like that. So that's all I got. I got the sign to say that I'm done. So um, if, if you have any questions, I'm going to stick around for a while, and I'm going to have your part. But uh, that's it. So anything else? Thank you.